welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very grateful that uh, Eric has uh, agreed to help me co-present today. Eric is a tax planner with Dobbins Financial, and so obviously we can appreciate how busy he has been this week, but uh, still graciously agreed to give us his time to come share some of his expertise with us regarding the tax consequences of debt forgiveness. Eric has presented over 100 seminars on the topics that we're going to be discussing today, and he and I were kind of joking before we got started about how you know, some of the things that we're sharing today are night and day from what we would have shared you know, even a couple of years ago. But uh, anyway, the, the IRS heard that uh, I'm going to be presenting here today, and they asked me to share a couple things with you. Uh, number one, they indicated that uh, if you have not yet filed your taxes, you're late, you need to get on that. And then number two, if you haven't sent in your payment, go ahead and make the payment directly to China. Um, uh, Jimmy Kimmel uh, had kind of an interesting strategy for paying taxes this year. He shared that uh, you know, he, he, realized, he said he's, he's just not going to pay, and then if the uh, IRS or the government comes and says they're going to throw him in prison, he's going to tell them, well, look, it costs a lot of money to incarcerate a prisoner, so why don't you just keep the money and we'll call it even. So I'm, I'm not a, a criminal lawyer or a, a tax evasion specialist, but that's probably unwise to do that. Um, I don't know if you've, you've noticed, but uh, it seems like the only thing on TV these days is uh, reality TV. But I've got good news if you're looking for some of that more traditional programming. I don't know if you remember Regis, Phil, uh, Regis Philman's uh, show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, they're going to bring that back to TV. Uh, but it's actually not going to air until 2014. And so in anticipation of the new Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, they're going to have to tweak it a little bit. And they're going to have to retitle it, Who Wants to Be a Quarter of a Millionaire? So anyway, uh, as you can see, you cannot deduct the government as a dependent on your taxes. Eric gave me that pointer. Thanks, Eric. Here's a real quote from uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. So that makes Eric a genius. All right, I'm going to give you kind of a, a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. You, hopefully you all have an outline in front of you. Uh, but I'm going to start off by just sharing a couple you know, things about uh, real property tax, state tax, tax liens, give you a couple comments about tax lien foreclosures. Uh, then we're going to talk about just the, the general rule uh, that is that you know, the forgiveness of debt is a taxable event and you know, what, what the consequences are of debt forgiveness, specifically regarding mortgages since we're, we're a real property section. Uh, we're going to talk about the Mortgage Debt Relief Act. Uh, that, that we all know was extended uh, through this year. It was supposed to sunset last year, but it was expend, extended through uh, December 31st of this year. Talk about what that means, what its relevance is, and uh, we're kind of going to look forward to next year, uh, assuming that that uh, sunsets, what other options will property owners have, what other strategies can they have to limit their liability, limit their taxes for debt forgiveness regarding a mortgage. So we'll talk about uh, specifically uh, the non-recourse exception, and Eric's going to share some of his expertise on that for us. And we'll go over just kind of generally what Arizona's anti-deficiency statutes are, but we'll leave it for Bill Kozub in a couple weeks or next month to, to get more in, in depth on that. Uh, and then also we'll, we'll close by just talking about some exemptions that apply. So let's say they take away the Mortgage Debt Relief Act. Let's say it's a, non, let's say it's a recourse loan, so we don't have the non-recourse uh, argument. Um, what other options do, do taxpayers have? And we'll talk about a couple of exemptions, the insolvency exemption, uh, the bankruptcy exemption, and then the capital loss uh, strategy that we can use. So I put up here on the board the reliance on council defense. I came across this uh, a number of years ago when I was representing a property owner who had been sued regarding the sale of their, their property in Paradise Valley. Uh, the property owner had been sued for uh, allegation regarding misrepresentations and omissions concerning the condition of the property. Specifically, the buyer purchased the property, wanted to tear it down, rebuild it, and there were height restrictions in the deed that weren't disclosed. So the buyer was upset and sued my client for about a million dollars. Now this client was one of the most prudent, just good people that I'd ever met. And he kept telling me, you know, Christopher, I, I did everything that I, that I thought I was supposed to do. I hired the best realtor in Paradise Valley. I deferred to them for, for guidance and counsel through this process, and yet here I am in this, in this lawsuit. 
So we came across this reliance of counsel defense that actually winning the case for us, this real estate case. But really where this was born out of was tax law um, for taxpayers who you know, made mistakes, you know, omissions um, uh, on, their, on their tax returns. And so this is a, a defense that comes up pretty commonly uh, in tax evasion cases. So anyway, the reason why I bring that up is it's one, one reason to work with a competent uh, tax professional or refer our clients to a tax professional so that if they make any mistakes Specifically, you know, there's some complicated issues we're talking about here today regarding the, the consequences of debt forgiveness. At least if they're working with a tax professional and they make a mistake, we can look to Eric and not the, not the client. Just kidding, Eric. All right, let's talk about uh, real property taxes in Arizona. Uh, we all know that uh, the taxpayer, the homeowner, is not personally liable for the property taxes. Uh, instead, uh, if the taxpayer doesn't pay the, the tax assessment, the, the state will put a, a tax lien on the property. And I put some, some cases in, in your materials for you in the statute. Uh, the first half of the property taxes are due October 1st, and the second half are due March 1st. Um, so that's what I indicated. Uh, unpaid property taxes generally will result in a lien if they're not paid. Um, so I, I've counseled hundreds, literally hundreds of, of property owners over the last three or four years regarding distressed properties and one of the questions that uh, the homeowner would, would ask me pretty commonly is, well if I'm not personally liable for the, for the property tax, do I need to pay it? And so my you know, canned response generally is yes for two reasons. Um, number one, uh, if you don't pay it, it, it could prevent you, if you want to maybe do a refinance. Uh, it, could, it could be a thorn in the refinance, or if you want to do a short sale, it could prevent uh, the short sale uh, or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So you want to stay current on those. The second reason you want to pay your taxes is because I live in Maricopa County. And so we all need to pay, you know, sh uh, pull our fair, fair weight. So that's, that's what I usually say, but uh, I don't know that that's entirely true. I, I do think that the legislature has done a pretty genius job with our tax lien um, our tax lien statutes, the way that the way the whole way the way the process works, because uh, the state of, the state of Arizona is pretty well protected whether or not uh, whether this taxpayer pays the, the taxes or not, uh, the state is going to get paid, and so we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, so a tax lien is you know the I put the definition up there on the board, but the tax lien is just a, a debt owed to the state that's secured by the property, and it's secured in, in a super priority position that even takes priority over purchase money loan. Um, so the way the way the process you know works is that the tax lien is assessed uh, in let's say 20 let's say 2013 for example it's due October 1st if that lien if that tax is not paid uh, then the taxpayer gets a full calendar year to redeem that by paying to to pay the tax at this point by paying whatever the principal amount is interest fees and costs by the to the, to the treasurer um, after that full calendar year so we're in 2013. If the taxes aren't paid you know, by October 1st, then by February 2015, the state, the treasurer's office, will have a tax lien auction. And they will sell the tax lien to the highest bidder at the auction. Um, and the bidding process is kind of opposite the, of the way a typical auction would be where the bidders bid the price up. Instead, the bidders offer to, pay, offer to buy the tax lien, uh, whatever the principal amount is with the fees, costs, interest, um, at the highest, and the bidders are going to try and get the highest interest rate. So the treasurer's office will start the bidding process at 16 percent, and then the bidders will bid the, the interest rate down. So they'll start at 16. Does any, do, do I hear 15? Does anybody want to pay 15 percent, 14 percent, and then bid it down? And I'll tell you in just a minute what the average uh, interest rate was on tax liens last year, but it's kind of shocking. Um, then after the after the, after the tax lien is sold at auction, uh, the taxpayer then has three years to redeem the tax lien by paying whatever the amount of the tax lien was plus the interest rates. So say it was 16% by paying 16% and then they'll pay that to the treasurer's office um, to redeem that. Uh, but they have three years from the date of this sale, which is ultimately five years from the date that the tax was assessed. So that's why I said it's, it's pretty good uh, program, a pretty good idea the way it's set up because it protects the property owners due rights, so it gives them plenty of opportunity to, to redeem the tax lien, to you know, get to keep the property, and then the state gets paid right away once they sell it at the tax lien. And it, it encourages investments with a high rate of return, generally a high rate of return, that's almost completely secured. 
uh, ultimately, I said there's three years to, to foreclose. Once the, once the successful bidder at the tax lien auction purchases the tax lien, they then have to wait three years to foreclose. So the, so the taxpayer has three years to redeem it. If they don't redeem it after three years, then the, the tax lien investor can just send a notice of intent to foreclose and then file a, a, a judicial action to foreclose on the tax lien. And when they, if, if the taxpayer does not redeem the unpaid tax lien, the investor gets the property free and clear. They, they foreclose, they're in first position, uh, subject to you know, some federal liens and things like that, but generally they're gonna be in first position, even ahead of purchase money loans, and can, and can foreclose and basically get a windfall, get a, you know, a, a property for the price of whatever they paid for uh, the tax lien. Now, that's one of the things I just wanted to, to, to mention. Is a lot of investors out there think that this is a, a, a really sweet investment. I'm gonna buy the tax lien for $10,000, foreclose and get a, a prop and get a $200,000 home for $10,000. So we researched what the statistics were for the last couple of years. Statistics show that about 85% of the tax liens purchased result in uh, redemption. So the taxpayer actually pays those back. So if somebody's purchasing tax liens with the idea of foreclosing, getting a, a property for really cheap, doesn't, doesn't usually happen. Um, but here's what's, what I think is pretty interesting. The aver average tax lien uh, interest for last year for 2012 was 9.93%. Does anyone know what other investment uh, had a higher interest rate than 9.93% last year? Real estate, at least in Arizona. Um, but I just want to, I wanted to show this information because attorneys I think are uniquely situated to uh, benefit from the tax lien process because they don't have to, the, the tax liens generally aren't you know, huge investments, $100,000 or they're thousands of dollars. And so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for an investor to purchase a tax lien for, you know, say, $5,000 and then hire an attorney for $2,500 or $5,000 um, to foreclose on the tax lien. Uh, their, their profits are going to go away. Uh, but attorneys are uniquely situated. They can send the demand letter, the notice of default, and if they have to, um, uh, file the action for foreclosure. But if you want to be strategic about this and purchase tax, lien, tax liens that you know will be redeemed and you'll get your... 10% or 9.93%, what, what uh, the investors can do is specifically target a tax lien that has a other mortgage, that has other liens, has other um, mortgages on the property. Because when you send the notice of intent to foreclose, you have to send notice to all the other lien holders. And because the tax lien is in senior position of even purchase money loans, you better believe that Bank of America or Wells Fargo is going to redeem that tax lien so that their security doesn't get eliminated. So when you send the notice of the intent to foreclose, you can send it you know, directly to you know, certified mail to Bank of America, send it to their legal counsel. I even send it to the local counsel here in Phoenix if I know who they are, give them a heads up, hey, you might want to tell your client to pay this so my client doesn't wipe out their lien. All right, so I mentioned that real estate is the, uh, one of the only other investments last year that had rates of return higher than tax liens. Um, this chart right here is provided by the National Association of Realtors. It just shows uh, what I think is kind of shocking to a lot of people, and that is the, the re relatively low percent of properties that were purchased by investors last year. Uh, but the, the average uh, appreciation in Maricopa County anyway last year was between 20 to 30 percent. So I've got a fun, uh, kind of a, a funny story. I, it wasn't funny about a year ago, but I can tell it today. Um, I'm working in real estate and helping uh, distressed property owners. I'm kind of on ground zero and, and saw what was happening with the market uh, from day one. Last March, I represented a client, came in to see me, had a really nice home in Arcadia, and uh, unfortunately had lost his job and just wasn't able to continue making the mortgage payments. Uh, so came to me for, for help with you know, what, what options he had uh, to, to get rid of the property, should he, you know, just what, what are his options? I went through the five different options with him, ultimately decided that a short sale was going to be in his and his family's best interest. So we put him in touch with a, with a realtor that, that we respect and had the realtor do a broker's price opinion, comparative market analysis to determine what the property was worth. And this was last March. The realtor determined that the property was worth about 460, single family home, uh, about 3,000 square feet in uh, Arcadia. So we put it on the market Friday afternoon for 460. By Monday morning, he had 11 offers and the property sold for cash for 610. So I, I, I told my wife, who we'd been talking about, at some point 
uh, you know, moving and buying another property, I said, honey, you know, we might think about putting our, our house on the market right now. Things are getting kind of crazy. So we did. We put it on the market. Uh, by the way, this is the house that I purchased before we had gotten married. Put it on the market. Uh, put it at a price way above what I'd paid for it, just kind of shooting for the moon. It doesn't hurt to ask. Let's just test the waters. Put it on the market. The next day, we got a full price offer. So I said, dang it, we priced, we priced it too low. Uh, so anyway, we you know, start, start moving forward with the transaction. Uh, my wife, who's an actuary, by the way, I, I'm a real estate attorney. My family owns a uh, REMAX franchise, and a, a relative of mine represented us in the transaction who's been practicing real estate for over 20 years. Um, with all of that experience, my wife, who's an actuary, tells me you know, the following night after we accepted the offer, honey, isn't there a two-year uh, waiting period uh, for the tax exemption before you can sell the house? And I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I went back and looked at the, the title report, and it, it had only been a, about a year and nine months. So uh, I, that was super embarrassing, to say the least, for the realtor and for me. Uh, but anyway, what she, of course, was talking about is the $250,000 tax exemption uh, that Eric's going to tell us a couple words about. And basically just what had happened is we had forgotten about it. You know, I know I'm not the only one. There's a lot of uh, tax uh, real estate professionals out there that had you know, just not given two, two, two thoughts about this exemption in the last five years because none of the homes had an equity to, to worry about. So I just want to say a, a couple words about the Affordable Health Care Act, basically just to confirm the rumors that we've all heard about this new real estate tax uh, buried in the, the new act. And uh, it is true that there is a, a new 3.8% tax on the sale of uh, real property uh, effective January 1st, 2013. So that, that's in effect immediately. Uh, it's additional 3.8% tax on capital gains, including the sale of real estate. Uh, the National Association of Realtors, AAR, you know, has, has downplayed this a little bit because fortunately it doesn't apply to everybody. It only applies to individuals with adjusted gross income of $250,000 or, I'm sorry, $200,000 or $250,000 if a married couple. So there's only about 2.4% uh, of Arizonans, at least in 2010, that fell into that category. So if the, if the adjusted gross income is below that, this new 3.8% tax doesn't apply. So, you know, some, some of the people in the real estate community have been saying, you know, don't really worry about it, it doesn't, doesn't really apply to, to many people. Um, that's, that's partially true, but I just want to share a story that happened to one of my clients last year uh, who earned, uh, it was a family, uh, the wife didn't work outside of the home, he was a software engineer and earned about $50,000. So obviously, you know, they, they, don't, they don't fall into this category, right? Well, they did. They, they inherited a farm and they were trying to sell the, the farm uh, and the proceeds, and they were going to sell the farm for like $500,000. Um, that, the sale of the farm now, even though he made $50,000 a year, uh, put him into that category, him and his family into that category. So we tried to do everything that we could before the end of the year to close on that transaction so that he wouldn't get hit with that 3.8% tax, which is going to be considerable, given the, uh, the amount of the sale. Um, so the, so the question is, is there a look back period? Is, it, uh, is the IRS going to look at what your income was for 2012 or for 2013? Let's say, you sell, let's say you sell the property this year. Will you fall into that category if you made above $200,000 last year? And my understanding is that it will only apply if you made $200,000 this year. And so remember, even if you made $50,000, but the sale of the house put you above that category, you're going to pay that tax. That's what I think is important for our clients to know. Oh, and then uh, if, it's a primary, if it's a primary residence, then the, the exemption that's, that Eric told, told us about just a minute ago still, still applies. But like in my client's situation, it was, you know, it was a, a farm uh, that he had been gifted, and so it, he did not get the benefit of that exemption. We're going to talk about uh, forgiveness, debt forgiveness. It's kind of hard to tell from this picture here, but Actually, of course, the, the wife is apologizing and bringing the flowers, and the, the, the man is saying thank you. It's kind of, kind of bound. Um, but the general rule is that the forgiveness of debt is uh, generally a taxable event. So if I gave Eric a $100,000 loan to start a new Jimmy John's franchise, and then next month I hit the Powerball, and uh, money is no longer an issue, and I call up Eric and I say, hey, remember that $100,000 loan? 
don't remember about, don't, don't uh, worry about repaying it, it's forgiven. You know, the IRS is going to see that as $100,000 in income, and he's going to have to claim that on his 2013 taxes. So that's the general rule, and so that, of course, applies to mortgage debt forgiveness. So if there's a short sale and the bank agrees to uh, forgive $100,000 in income, or I'm sorry, $100,000 in debt, then that's going to generally be $100,000 in income for the taxpayer. Uh, same thing with the foreclosure or a deed in lieu or a loan modification. You know, if there's a loan workout and they, they write off $100,000 of the loan, uh, generally taxable uh, income. Uh, but pursuant to the Mortgage Debt Relief Act of 2007, uh, the forgiveness of debt regarding a primary residence or a principal residence, qualified principal residence, is not a taxable event. That, now, this, this law was supposed to sunset at the end of last year, but it was uh, extended uh, through emergency legislation at the end of the year through the end of this year. I don't know if it'll be uh, extended again, but I think we need to plan and tell our clients to, to assume that this is it, this is the only, uh, this, is, this is the last break that they're going to get. Okay, what the law says is the forgiveness of uh, a mortgage regarding a qualified principal residence does not qualify as a taxable income. A qualified principal residence uh, mortgage is a loan that was used to purchase or substantially improve the property. Uh, and it has to be a primary residence, and the, the primary residence is defined, as Eric shared with us earlier, a, a property that the taxpayer has lived in, periods aggregating two out of the last five years. Um, so it only applies, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act only applies to a principal residence. It doesn't apply to investment property. It doesn't apply to uh, vacation homes. Uh, but the interesting thing that I mentioned there is that it also applies to loans used to substantially improve the property. So that means that it also applies to a HELOC, a loan that was taken out, say, a year after you bought the home uh, to substantially improve the property. And that's defined as uh, proceeds used to uh, add a swimming pool. Uh, I think that's like the easiest example is to put in a swimming pool. It does not apply to proceeds used to repair the roof or to replace the plumbing. So it doesn't apply to repair costs, but it does apply to, to improvements, to doing an addition, adding on a, a fifth bedroom, swimming pool, something like that. HELOCs can be protected. Uh, the exclusion for the debt forgiveness is limited to $2 million in debt. So if the bank, it's a, if it's qualified principal residence and the bank forgives $2.5 million, the taxpayer is only, uh, excluded, can only exclude $2 million. That sounds like a lot of debt to, to, to exclude for a principal residence, with residential property, but I actually negotiated a short sale last year with a national lender where the lender forgave over $2 million in debt. And a lot of that was uh, recourse, uh, recourse debt. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's excluded up to a million, $2 million for a married couple, $1 million for an individual. And the, the, I have it on the screen, but it only applies to debt discharge between 2006 and through the end of this year. Christopher? Yes, sir. What about a rental property? So, you, so it is taxable, right? It's not available. So right now we're just talking about the 2007 Mortgage Debt Relief Act, which only applies to a principal residence. Okay, so it only applies to residential property, a principal residence. So the question is, what if it's a rental property? So if it's, if it's a rental property and it's not protected under the 2007 Mortgage Debt Relief Act, Relief Act and the taxpayer sells the property at a capital loss, what's the outcome? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So if you don't mind just holding your question, Eric's going to address that specific issue in just a minute. Oh, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act may apply to a refinance. So if the taxpayer refinances their purchase money mortgage and doesn't take any cash out, uh, they're going to be protected under the, under the Act for the full amount. Similarly, if they refinance their, their mortgage and take $100,000 out and use that $100,000 to substantially improve the property, they're still going to be protected. Now, one of the things that the taxpayer needs to be super uh, cautious of is making sure that they have evidence to document um, these improvements that they've done. Because uh, keep in mind that you know, this, when, they, when they claim the, um, when they file their taxes, say they, they, they short sale or lose the house to foreclosure, 
you know, it might be, you know, years ago that they substantially improved the property. They're going to need to, if they ever get audited, they're going to need to have corroborating evidence to show that, uh, show where they put the money. They're, and the best evidence really is going to be pictures, um, receipts from uh, contractors. Uh, but Eric was telling me a story the other day about how he was able to go into Google Earth um, or you even go to the county assessor's office and get photographs showing kind of before and after what improvements you did to the property. Um, one of the things the clients need to be aware of is that uh, they can count on the IR, they, they can count on the lender issuing a 1099C regarding the debt forgiveness. Uh, a lot of homeowners kind of get shocked when you know they they negotiated a short sale with the bank or foreclosure, and then the next February they get a 1099C and they get kind of freaked out that now they got to pay taxes on this. So the 1099C is required. You know the lenders are required by the IRS to issue this form, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the taxpayer owes taxes on whatever amount is put in the box here. Um, the taxpayer now can file a, a form in response to the 1099C that's known as the 1090, uh, I'm sorry, the 982. Uh, the 982 form the taxpayer can use to identify what exclusion uh, applies so that they don't have to pay taxes on this. And Eric mentioned that one of the things that the IRS does really good at, the auditors, is kind of matching up um, forms. So if they receive a, if they, if they have a 1099 form, they're going to want to double check to make sure that you've got the 982, ex, you know, clearly stating why you don't owe taxes on this. And if you didn't pay taxes and you don't have the 982 form, count on getting audited. Eric said that he could solve the national debt by uh, just going out and auditing um, uh, everybody that has uh, had a short sale or foreclosure over the last few years because a lot of people have, have handled this either incorrectly or didn't do a good job of uh, keeping receipts and pictures to show uh, that they're entitled to the exemption. I put a couple of hypotheticals in your slides and in your, your manual. Uh, you can take a look at those. You know, if you can't sleep tonight, if you have insomnia or something like that, it'll put you right to bed. But uh, they do drive home the, just the point of uh, identifying you know, the, the, the characterization of the loan. Was it purchase money? Was it a refinance? Money taken out to, to buy, uh, to substantially improve the property or not. Uh, but we don't have time to get into those, so we'll pass over those. Um, as I mentioned, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act does sunset the end of this year, so let's assume that it is not extended. Uh, what does that mean for the, the homeowners that, that still have distressed properties? that are upside down, uh, that they ultimately do decide to, that they want to do a short sale or they lose it to, to, to foreclosure. Are they going to have tax consequences next year? Um, is it going to be the, you know, the end of the world for, for our real estate market? Is this going to create another crash? Um, I'm happy to say, I, I seriously doubt it. There's still um, uh, several protections available for Arizona, property owners, at least in Arizona. And so we're going to talk about uh, what it means if the loan is non-recourse uh, and uh, also a couple of exemptions. So uh, according to the IRS, the I put the definitions on the board here. A recourse loan is a loan that you're personally liable for, that the borrower is personally liable for. A non-recourse loan is everything else. Uh, the lender's only remedy is to take back the security. So of course we know under Arizona's anti-deficiency statutes, ARS 33-729 and 33-814, um, most loans used to buy a single family home situated on two and a half acres or less that is utilized as a dwelling are going to be non-recourse loans. Um, and so as I mentioned, Bob Kozub is going to come tell us uh, next month or in a couple of months about uh, some interesting case law that's come out uh, interpreting those statutes and in some cases expanding those statutes um, so that property owners in Arizona are, are going to be able to benefit from this non-recourse exemption we're going to talk about in the majority of the cases. In fact, you know, this, this Mueller case, this m &I Bank versus Mueller case, now has even arguably extended the anti-deficiency statutes to vacant lots in some cases. Um, kind of an interesting decision, but anyway, so property owners that have lost vacant lots that have some improvements still might be able to avoid having to pay taxes on debt forgiveness. Number one, in Arizona, a, a lot of property owners still will get uh, the benefit of having the, not the, the mortgage debt forgiveness forgiven, uh, having an exemption to having to pay taxes on that. A lot of property owners will still get the benefit of having an exemption under the non-recourse exemption that he told us about. But the taxpayer still may have to pay taxes, depending on what the adjusted basis is on the property at the time that they sell it. 
Okay, so just because it's a non-recourse loan and they're protected, they still may have to pay taxes depending on the adjusted basis. But there's a couple exemptions, and I want to kind of flip through these so I make sure that we get to the, the last part, which is this gentleman's question over here regarding the capital loss. Okay, so what, an exemption that, that applies that covers a lot of uh, property owners is the insolvency exemption. Uh, the definition of insolvency, uh, according to the IRS, is simply that the total amount of the liabilities exceeds the current fair market value of the total assets of the taxpayer. Now, that that defines most Americans. That's just the way we, we live our lives, and especially with mortgages. So the, the liabilities includes mortgages. So the, the taxpayer gets to include their mortgage, and then the fair market value of the, of the property secured by the mortgage uh, is usually, if it's a distressed property we're talking about here, is going to be less than that. So many, many taxpayers will get the benefit of the insolvency exemption, even if the Mortgage Debt Relief Act doesn't apply and it's a recourse debt. And there's an insolvency worksheet for the taxpayer to complete to, to calculate whether or not they're insolvent. Um, important, important practice pointer, insolvency, uh, the, the relevant date uh, of insolvency is the date immediately before the debt forgiveness. So it's either the date before the short sale closes escrow or the date before the trustee sale. Um, so the taxpayer is going to want to you know, recreate that moment in time, have checking account statements, uh, uh, comparative market analysis from a realtor regarding the property's fair market value, the date of the short sale, things like that. And you know, unfortunately, if they come to us for the first time, you know, a year after the short sale, it's going to be difficult to do that. So, just a heads up on on again having evidence to support the exemption. The other exemption is the bankruptcy exemption. Uh, we don't have uh, time to go into that too much, but the important takeaway from that is that the in order to qualify for the exemption the taxpayer has to have either closed on the short sale or had the property foreclosed before filing bankruptcy. All right, we, we are out of time, and I know you all have uh, places to go, so thank you.